day-to-day -day recovery services. Uh, I uh, also lecture at ASU. Today we're going to talk about the war on drugs. First, the question is how did we get to the place where we are where prisons are the preferred solution for drug abuse rather than rehabilitation. The war on drugs uh, has its roots in the policies of racist oppression going back as far as the 1880s and we're going to cover the history of the war on drugs through today. Another theme that runs through this talk is that culture is stronger than law. The study of societies across human history shows that laws cannot change culture but when laws are passed that don't coincide with the culture laws can become a highly effective tool of cultural oppression oppressing those cultures that a government wishes to oppress. And we see that uh, throughout the history of the war on drugs. In the 1880s, uh, the war on drugs, again, had its roots in cultural oppression. Uh, and it was used as a tool to begin with as a vehicle to take away land from Mexicans in the Southwest. Marijuana was part of Mexican culture. Marijuana grew like a weed uh, in North America. Uh, but not so for Europeans. In Europe, marijuana was not known. It didn't grow there naturally. And so for Europeans, marijuana was never part of their culture. In the 1880s, as European Americans moved into the Southwest and sought to uh, take those lands for themselves and away from Mexicans, uh, marijuana became a tool in order to do that. It was the Wild Wild West. And uh, things like this would happen. The township of San Antonio would start and just a bunch of guys european americans with guns would set up shop and say this is the township of san antonio there were really no courts there was nobody to stop them and they'd see a uh, plantation a uh, fertile area uh, that they wanted of course mexicans would be on that land owning it farming it and the uh, san antonio township would extend its borders onto that plantation and within the San Antonio Township, marijuana smoking was illegal. Marijuana smoking was common in these areas, and so the San Antonio board members with guns would wait for and, and look for uh, Mexicans smoking marijuana on the land that they wanted. And when they found it, they would arrest the Mexican and either take him to jail or more often throw him on a wagon and uh, leave him south of the Rio Grande. By the time the Mexican landowner got back to his own property, he would find European Americans with guns surrounding the property saying, you broke the law. This is no longer your property. And so quickly in the Southwest, uh, laws that were supposed to constrain marijuana smoking became tools to actually constrain Mexicans and take land from Mexicans and uh, eventually from Mexico uh, entirely. We move into the early 20th century and drugs were basically legal in uh, Eastern American cities. Uh, Coca-Cola had cocaine in it. And if you go back and look at cough syrup from the time, common ingredients were morphine, cannabis, chloroform, and of course alcohol. And uh, these uh, ingredients were not in small quantities. And you could just buy this over the counter. You could buy morphine over the counter. You could buy cocaine over the counter. Drugs were basically legal at the time in Eastern cities. We move into the era of prohibition, the uh, early 1900s. And prohibition, actually, interestingly, was also uh, political in a way. Uh, women were looking for the right to vote. Uh, at the same time that they were having this prohibition movement and these two things combined for women and women really led the charge for prohibition in the United States and uh, eventually when they got the right to vote their interest in prohibition waned. In order to enact alcohol prohibition in the United States there was it was necessary to pass a constitutional amendment and the constitutional amendment banned the sale and consumption of alcohol. As we all know, prohibition was a mess. People did not stop drinking alcohol, and that's again because culture is stronger than law. You cannot change culture through law. What prohibition mainly led to was the rise of gangsterism in the United States, as bootlegging alcohol became a main way to make money and a, a great way um, to uh, gain power. Joe Kennedy, the scion of the Kennedy family, made most of his money from bootlegging alcohol in the era of prohibition. And of course, then his family was able to become an elite power in the United States. 
But keep in mind, a constitutional amendment was necessary to make alcohol illegal at that time. It ended up a complete mess. Another constitutional amendment was necessary in order to repeal prohibition. Then in the 1940s, uh, America was becoming actually more multicultural. Uh, Harlem was the center of multiculturalism on the East Coast, and in Harlem, blacks, whites, and other races would party together. And one of their main ways of interacting was through the use of drugs, and drugs were legal at the time. And people who had power in America, they didn't like this sort of mixing in the 1940s. And uh, drugs uh, got on the radar of the government as something that was problematic in terms of racial segregation. After World War II, we're into the 1950s, movements for black equality began to rise throughout black communities in the United States. And at that time, the DEA was created in the United States and uh, drugs were uh, made illegal. Now, constitutional amendment was necessary for the prohibition of alcohol. But the reality was that Americans were not going to vote for a constitutional amendment uh, against drug use in the 1950s. So all federal drug laws at that time and still today were put under the Commerce Clause. And the Commerce Clause is a small little clause in the Constitution that was meant to keep states from putting tariffs on their textiles as they traded them to other states. The Commerce Clause as inter uh, or regulating interstate trade was seen as a vehicle to make all drugs illegal in the United States, except for alcohol, because there was no will to do that any longer. I'm on good legal ground. Uh, Sandra Day O'Connor on the Supreme Court and uh, Justice Clarence Thomas have argued this in Reich vs. Gonzalez. It's real questionable whether it's constitutional to have drug laws fall under the Commerce Clause. The Ninth Amendment states the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. In other words, if it's not enumerated in the Constitution, if it's not worded within the Constitution as a power of the federal government, the federal government does not have the right to regulate that issue, those goods. And nowhere in the Constitution does it mention intoxicants. Nevertheless, as the Civil Rights Movement grew throughout the 1950s and 60s, so did the Justice Department's interest in uh, prosecuting drugs uh, as a crime under the Commerce Clause. In the 1960s, there was a governor of New York known as Nelson Rockefeller. And Rockefeller had been a long incumbent and, of course, comes from a very powerful elite family. In the mid-60s, he was behind uh, the, in the polls in an election for governor of New York. He was really the first politician, or at least modern politician, to use a, a drug scare as a means to gain votes. He declared in what was, could really be seen as political genius that there was a scourge of heroin affecting inner New York City. What Nelson Rockefeller had landed on was a concept known as race baiting. And race baiting is when a politician uses coded terminology to suggest that black and brown people are the problem without actually having to say that black and brown people are the problem. And the New York electorate in the mid-60s knew exactly what Nelson Rockefeller was referring to when he said there's a scourge of heroin in the inner city. And it spoke to them as the civil rights movement had made incredible gains at that time. Now, always remember, drug use was occurring throughout American society. Drug use has always occurred throughout American society in every culture. Drug use is an aspect of human culture. And so to imagine that it is more uh, of a cultural practice of certain cultures than other cultures is really missing the point. It isn't. It never has been, and it never will be. Drug use is human. When Rockefeller won by a landslide, race baiting became a major tool of uh, American politicians. In 1972, Richard Nixon was running for president as an incumbent, and he was uh, behind in the polls. And he took the page from Nelson Rockefeller. He declared that there was a scourge of heroin in every inner American city. He was the man to take care of it. 
And it really is the birth of what we now call the modern war on drugs. Nixon won in a landslide. Heroin abuse continued and only grew. As globalization took place, planes were now in, in effect, and more drugs were coming into the nation. There's no doubt about that. They were being used everywhere. In the 1970s, you get a confluence of rising drug use, uh, rising drug importation, and what's called deindustrialization. In order to really understand deindustrialization, one has to understand that from 1900 on, black families had gravitated to the inner cities of the United States because they could find manufacturing jobs there. These manufacturing jobs, they didn't require degrees. Segregation kept black Americans from getting educated. And in the inner city, they could find good paying manufacturing jobs. And once the civil rights movement, there was great hope in the inner city, um, in black communities, for a middle class life, to send their children to college, to have the American dream. Well, by the early 1970s, uh, corporations realized that there was cheaper labor around the world. And again, globalization really started to take hold and it made it possible for corporations to access this cheap labor in far off parts of the world. And they moved their manufacturing facilities out of the inner city and into the far off parts of the world. And unemployment shot up in the inner city. As unemployment was skyrocketing, the inner cities uh, in, within the United States, they fell apart. As the jobs went out, the drugs came in. We're still suffering from the effects of deindustrialization and rising unemployment and rising drug abuse. These things are connected. In the 1980s, the new drug scourge became the crack epidemic. What people need to realize is that street level drug dealers are not importing drugs into this country. Drugs are coming in in the tons and no street level drug dealer has the money or the cover to bring drugs into this country. So who is bringing drugs into this country? Elites. They're either elite in the United States or they're foreign elites, but it is not the street level drug dealer. In the late 80s, George H.W. Bush, who had his family's roots within the intelligence community from long back, Prescott Bush, back in the 1950s, uh, started the CIA. H.W. ramped up the war on drugs. And he ramped it up with money, he ramped it up with police, he ramped it up with courts, and he ramped it up with laws. And his ramp up of the war on drugs was focused squarely on the inner city. But if you know anything about 1980s culture, drugs were rampant everywhere, especially cocaine. Just watch the movie The Wolf of Wall Street. Just watch the movie Studio 54. Drugs were everywhere, and they were being abused by elites in greater quantities than people in the inner city. Drugs cost money. Poor people don't have the sort of money to run the drug trade. They don't have the sort of money to account for the amount of drugs that are coming into this nation and being done in this nation. But that's not the stigma that we've developed in this nation around drugs. The stigma that we've developed in this nation around drugs is that it is mainly an epidemic of poor black and brown people. And that goes all the way back to the history of culture being stronger than law, but laws being able to be used as a vehicle of oppression of certain cultures. We don't see elites going to jail, not in the 80s and not now. What we see is poor black and brown people going to jail hugely disproportionately. For example, blacks currently make up 13% of American society. And the numbers are very clear on this. They make up 13% of drug users and drug abusers and drug dealers. These things are very proportionate. If you want to find uh, a really, really good research and numbers on that, you can refer to Dr. Carl Hart. Uh, his most recent book is called High Price. And so although 13% of drug users and abusers are black, well over 50% of the prison population in on drug crimes are black. You have to step back and ask yourself why? How did it come to be that way? It's not because black people are using more drugs than the rest of our society. There's deeper reasons 
And I hope this talk is bringing out some of those deeper reasons. In the 1980s, we also got the rise of the privatized prison system, led by what's known as the Correction Corporations of America. And now prisons became not a way to help people, or at least keep them off the streets, or not only that. It became a means of profit. Now, when the Corrections Corporation of America builds a prison for a state in the United States, like Arizona State, they'll build it. They'll pay for it. But if that prison doesn't stay filled, there are huge penalties for the state. And so, states know we need to keep this prison filled. The main method that states all over the United States are using to keep their privatized prisons full and the profits flowing is the war on drugs. Today, from the 1990s on and into today, the stigma is entrenched. We see drug use as a epidemic among the poor, among black and brown people. We ignore the fact that drug use is everywhere, all around us in every community. A police state has risen around the war on drugs. 500 times a week, SWAT teams knock down people's doors, many times the wrong doors, and they abuse people and brutalize people. Why? For doing drugs. Nothing will stop drug use in the United States or in any human culture. But us, our citizens, we're being hurt every day by the war on drugs being brutalized, citizens of all types. Meanwhile, elites who are profiting from the war on drugs, they get off scot-free. For example, HSBC, a huge bank, they were caught laundering billions of dollars of drug money for cartels. They were caught red-handed, there was no denying this. They paid a small, relatively small financial penalty, and no one went to jail. Eric Holder, the attorney general at the time, was asked, why isn't anyone going to jail? And he had the nerve to say that not only is HSBC too big to fail, but their CEO is too big to jail. We have more people currently in jail on drug crimes than the nations of England, France, Germany, and Japan combined have in jail for all crimes. Does this sound like freedom, America? It just doesn't sound like freedom to me. Trey Raydell, a congressman in Florida, he led the charge to drug test welfare recipients in Florida. He got it passed. Some months later, Trey Raydell was found with an ounce of cocaine in his car. This is the hypocrisy of the war on drugs. Trey Riddell got a deferred judgment. He never got jail time. And within months, the charge was completely expunged from his record. And he again is a politician running for Congress. Meanwhile, less than 1% of the welfare recipients who've been tested for drugs come up positive. So what are our solutions for the war on drugs? Drug testing welfare recipients, it doesn't solve a thing. What we need to do is destigmatize drug use. We need to realize that drug use is not an inner city phenomenon. And we know this, and yet we don't apply it in our politics or our policies. Drug use and abuse is everywhere, all around us in American society. Putting people in prison is not going to help. It's not going to stop this epidemic. Drugs are used in every community. The addict is as likely to be your neighbor, your doctor, your sibling, your child, your friend. The war on drugs is a war on us all. Addiction is a disease, not a crime. It needs to be stopped or treated as a disease and not a crime. We need more beds and rehabs, not prisons. We need more money for mental health, not profits for the Corrections Corporation of America. And most importantly, we need to stop the war on drugs.